Welcome to Victory Tabernacle Online. We're so glad that you have chosen to join us today for this lesson that we're going to be teaching called Blessed by Association. You see, access to God through Bible study, prayer, and the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us is a privilege and a responsibility of every believer to take advantage of. We are blessed by association. In various places in the Bible, we are assured that we are a child of God, a friend of God, and our brother is Jesus Christ, even though at the same time, he is our great high priest. The term that we could use to describe our position in Christ would be, it's not so much what you know, it is who you know that really counts. There was a pastor in a small town, Midwestern city. He sat reading the Saturday newspaper. He turned to the religious section and was surprised to see a full page article on another church in his community. So that following week, he called the pastor and he asked how he managed to get such a fantastic coverage. His colleague answered, oh, that's easy to explain. We have the managing editor in our congregation. In other words, he had a contact on the inside. He had an inside man, someone with clout, leverage, with pull. So again, it isn't what you know so much as who you know. Have you ever had an experience where it paid to know the right person? Perhaps you had a relative or a friend in just the right position to assist you. It pays to have someone you know in high places, like I experienced when I was about 30 years of age. I was living in Sacramento at the time and trying to start my own truck brokerage business, but was having a very hard time getting it off the ground. I was really discouraged, but miraculously, one day I got a call from an old friend of mine that was working at a very influential company in downtown San Francisco. He asked me if I would be interested in taking his place as the transportation manager of this large company because he was going to be leaving and that position would become available. There is absolutely no way that I could have ever got that position if I had not known him. I told him, I said, you better believe it. I, how fast can I get there? <laughs> I wasn't really qualified for the job, but it was not what I knew, but who I knew that counted. I knew my friend, Bernal Monroe, but even greater than that, I knew my heavenly father who has everything under control. He can do exceedingly more than we can ask, think, or imagine. When I went for my interview, they hired me on the spot and gave me an office on the 14th floor overlooking the bay in downtown San Francisco. That would have never happened had I not known the person there that I was taking his place. Likewise, never underestimate knowing Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You see in that scripture, you can you notice believers have a positional advantage over unbelievers. Believers have a high priest who goes to the Father on their behalf. In other words, they have spiritual clout, leverage, someone with a capital S on the inside. It's not Superman, but it's the Savior. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have found your way into the kingdom of God, which the Bible says it is a kingdom that will never pass away. Earthly kingdoms come and go, but the kingdom of God that Jesus established when he was here on the earth, the Bible says, will never pass away. In God's kingdom, there is forgiveness, salvation, eternal life, peace that the world will never understand, joy unspeakable, contentment, and adoption. I love that word adoption. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. 
you imagine how wonderful and powerful that scripture is? Before the worlds were ever created, the Bible says that he thought about us and he predestined us to be his son. He adopted us into his kingdom and gave us and made us an heir, a co-heir with his son, his, begot, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Cider House Rules, but that one makes me cry every time I see it. It's about an adoption house where the children wait for someone to come and adopt them. When a family comes, every once in a while, all the children line up and the man and his wife slowly move along the line deciding which child to adopt and take home with them. The message I get from the movie is that only one child is adopted each time, but I think that my Heavenly Father, that if He were to show up, He would adopt them all. That's why He said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I can just see Jesus with arms wide open, Him standing there in front of all those children, lined up. And then He just says, He opens His, puts His hands out, and He says, Whoever desires to go home with me, come. And I can see every last one of them running as fast as they can and jumping into the arms of Jesus. If we have believed our way into God's family, it is not because we deserve to be there or because we worked our way in, but because Jesus set his love upon us and opened the way by giving his life for us. If we've been born again, we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. If we are walking in fellowship with God, we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. If we truly know the Lord, we can find grace to help in time of need. When I search the scriptures, I can find many people who knew somebody and accomplished things they could never dreamed of doing by themselves. Here are just a few. Gideon defeated the Midianites because he knew somebody. Daniel survived dinner at the Lions Club because he knew somebody. David was able to defeat the giant because he knew somebody. Moses was able to lead Israel out of bondage because he knew somebody. Peter and John were delivered from prison because they knew somebody. And if you and I are experiencing the power of God in our lives today, it is because we know somebody. And that somebody, that all the great people in the Bible that did extraordinary feats of power, was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not what you know, it's who you know. A father took his children to the country fair one day, and since they were obviously not interested in the animals, the father bought a whole row of tickets for the various rides. As each of the children approached a ride, they would hold out their hand to get a ticket from their father. At one ride, after all his children had received tickets, a strange boy held out his hand, expecting a ticket. Well, the father was not about to give this boy a ticket, so he drew his hand back. But upon seeing this, his son turned and said to his dad, It's okay, Dad. This is my friend. I told him that you would give him a ticket. You know what that father did? Of course, he gave the boy a ticket in his son's name. You see, that boy got a ride not because of what he knew, but because of who he knew. He knew the Son who knew the Father. He was blessed by association. And that's a picture of our dilemma. We were lost without a ticket to ride, but Jesus asked the Father and gave us a ticket to the land beyond the stars. Look around you. In all manner of life, you can see the advantages of knowing the right person. It gives us access to greater achievements, health, and wealth, and a joy-filled life. As believers, we have access. The word access is found only three times in the New Testament. Romans 5, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith. How did we get it? By faith into his gra this grace in which we now stand. God's throne is the throne of grace, and we have undeserved favor to go into the throne room of grace and ask for God's help in time of need, and he will grant it to us because we are a son and a daughter of the Almighty God. 
Ephesians 2.18 says, For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Though he is sovereign, he can still, we can still approach him as a child does a father. Ephesians 3.12 says, In whom Jesus we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wasn't that beautiful? We have access, praise God. We have access to grace, our Father, and the throne of God 24-7. But the essential ingredient to access is prayer. Hebrews 10.22 says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. Privilege always carries responsibilities. We must pray. Why? Well, because of what prayer does to us. Someone once asked, someone once asked, why pray if God loves us and he knows everything we need before we ask? Well, because he told us to ask. And if he knows that prayer is the one thing we need first and foremost, what is the main object in God's idea of prayer is the supplying of our greatest need. And in prayer, we find out that what we need most is him. Because prayer of what prayer does in the church. I've been in ministry over 50 years, and I can tell you without any reservation that the difference between a powerful service and a powerless service is prayer. Prayer heals. Prayer saves. Prayer changes things. Prayer brings the anointing to lift heavy burdens and break every yoke. Prayer brings us into his presence, and in his presence, the Bible says, is fullness of joy. Prayer is the key to the gates of heaven and the throne of God. We must pray because Jesus prayed. He prayed because of the demands of the people. Their needs were so great. He became exhausted in prayer, physically and emotionally. Even though he was God, he was also man. He felt the pressures of life like we do. So he got away from the crowds and the busyness to be alone with his father. Jesus was always praying. We have records of him praying morning, noon, and night, and sometimes even all night. That is what we need in this nation right now, in our families, in our lives. We need to be praying on all occasions. It might be in a parked car. It might be a church sanctuary, public park, a bedroom, a bathroom, even a cemetery. The point is, we need a place and a time where we can hear God and where he can hear from us. It will take sacrifice, discipline, and planning, but we must have to make room for it. We all struggle with making time for prayer, but we must pray. There's a part of us that wants to pray and a part that does not. That part that does not is our emotions, and the part that does is our intellect and will. We know we need to pray, but our emotions get in the way. We let our emotions rule us and keep us busy, but we, we must will ourselves to pray. Here's what one man said as he struggled his way to victory. He said, as never before, my will and I stood face to face. I asked my will the straight question, Will, are you ready for an hour of prayer? And Will answered, here am I, and I'm quite ready if you are. So Will and I linked arms and turned to go for our time of prayer. At once, emotions begin pulling the other way and protesting. We're not coming. We have things to do. We saw Will stagger just a bit. So I asked, Will, can you overcome your emotions? And Will replied, I can if you can. So Will and I got down to pray dragging our self-centered emotions into the prayer room with us. When you pray, remember three things. The love of God wants the best for you. The wisdom of God knows what's best for you. And the power of God can accomplish it for you. Remember the examples in the Bible of Peter being tossed into a prison cell to die the next day. But God's people started a prayer meeting. And God sent his angel to fetch the apostle Peter out of prison. I asked you, how did Peter escape the prison walls? It was not because he was MacGyver. It was not because he knew the prison guard or the warden. But it was prayer. 
that fetched the angel. It was prayer that opened the jail cell and put the guards to sleep while Peter and the angel walked out free men. Knowing that intercessory prayer is our mightiest weapon and the supreme call of all Christians today, I pleadingly urge you to be people of prayer, believing that prayer is the greatest contribution that we can make in this critical hour. I humbly urge that we take time to pray. I mean to really pray. Let there be prayer at sunup, noonday, sundown, midnight, all throughout the day. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Let us pray for our children, our youth, our aged, our pastors, our homes. Let us pray for our churches. Let us pray for ourselves that we may not lose the word concern out of our Christian vocabulary. Let us pray for our nation. Yes, that's right. Pray for your nation. Call their names in prayer. The president, the vice president, all the members of cabinets. If you don't know them all, you just have to say all the members of the House of Representatives and all the members of the Senate and all those that work in government. Let us pray for those who have never known Jesus Christ and the redeeming love for moral forces everywhere, for our leaders. Let prayer be our passion. Let prayer be our practice. Let us be obedient to God's word. I would like to touch on one more thing before I close this message on blessed by association. It is highly important that you be associated with a church and a God-fearing pastor, not just any pastor, but a man of God, a man of God that knows how to pray encourage and preach the word of God. Being associated with the pastor is probably the number two most important thing that you'll ever do in life. Of course, number one is carrying the disciples cross, but number two is getting into a body of believers that has a godly man of God as their pastor. We have an example of the importance of being associated with a man of God in 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going to read from the NIV of the Bible. If you want to follow along with me, I'm not going to be putting these scriptures up on the screen because there's too many of them, but you can grab your Bible, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. First, it tells us about Elijah announcing a great drought. It says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead, Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Can you imagine that? Here is a man that is so confident in God and in the power of prayer that he is able to go before the king and tell the king that God is going to turn off the waterworks of heaven until he tells God to turn the water back on. Verse 2, after he tells the king that, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the cherished ravine east of Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the cherished ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Man, can you imagine the power of God in that, in those scriptures that he was able to God actually had ravens bringing him hot biscuits from heaven every morning. And he was able to enjoy steak in the dinner in the dinner time. He was able to be fed meat in the morning and meat in the evening. And if he was thirsty, he just went over to the brook and got something to drink. God takes care of his people. Amen. Verse 7. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Sometimes it's time to move on. If God dries up the brook, then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So when God spoke to him, immediately he did what God told him to do. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. <clears throat> she was a poor mother. Notice that's important to remember. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. 
And she says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home. I'm going to make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it, and then we're going to die. And Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. How many times in the Bible, when we're at our wit's end, we're at the very bottom and don't know what to do. We're scared to death. But God says through the man of God, don't be afraid. Go home. Do as you have said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. That is amazing to me that he asked that she would take care of him, the man of God. In other words, do your tithing first and I'll take care of you after that. That's the way I read that. For this is what the Lord says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. So she went away. She did as Elijah had told her. So she noticed he told her what to do. She went. She did what he told her to do. And because she obeyed the man of God and did what he said, there was food every day for Elijah and the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah, it happened exactly as the Lord had spoken through his man of God. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house. Notice, now she's a rich mother. First, before she meets the man of God, she's a poor woman, getting ready to make her last meal and eat it with her son and die. I mean, that is as low and as as you can go, but now she gets to meet the, the man of God, and I would imagine that she probably even sold some of that oil, and, and uh, she had bread. If she, she made a lot of bread, she probably sold the bread, because now she's a rich mother. But her son, <coughs> excuse me, who became ill, he grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? She, the whole thing turns around here. She really gets worried. Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, did you see the power of prayer again? Have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with? by causing her son to die. Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. This man of God knew how to pray because the Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Notice he prayed, God gave the answer. Elijah picked up the child, carried him down from the room into the house and he gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. And then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Hallelujah. Blessed by association. Know God and know a man of God. 2 Corinthians 20.20 20, Believe in the Lord your God and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. It is so very, very important that you uh, be associated with a body of believers and a man of God because you are blessed by association. God bless you today and thank you for tuning in. Hope you received something that has blessed you and we'll be seeing you next week. God bless you. Thank you for watching this teaching video all the way through. We've come to the end. If you'd like to hear more, just go to our website, thetabernacle.com, for many more worship videos, sermons, and teachings. God bless you. We love you. Goodbye.